Chapter Twenty of Sylvie and Bruno. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patty Cunningham. Sylvie and Bruno by Lewis Carroll. Chapter Twenty. Light come, light go. Lady Muriel's smile of welcome could not quite conceal the look of surprise with which she regarded my new companions. I presented them in due form. This is Sylvie, Lady Muriel, and this is Bruno. Any surname, she inquired, her eyes twinkling with fun. No, I said gravely, no surname. She laughed, evidently thinking I said it in fun, and stooped to kiss the children a salute to which Bruno submitted with reluctance. Sylvie returned it with interest. While she and Arthur, who had arrived before me, supplied the children with tea and cake, I tried to engage the Earl in conversation. But he was restless and distrait, and we made little progress. At last, by a sudden question, he betrayed the cause of his disquiet. "'Would you let me look at those flowers you have in your hand?' "'Willingly,' I said, handing him the bouquet. Botany was, I knew, a favorite study of his, and these flowers were to me so entirely new and mysterious that I was really curious to see what a botanist would say of them. They did not diminish his disquiet. On the contrary, he became every moment more excited as he turned them over. These are all from central India, he said, laying aside part of the bouquet. They are rare even there, and I have never seen them in any other part of the world. These two are Mexican. This one, he rose hastily and carried it to the window to examine it in a better light, the flush of excitement mounting to his very forehead is i am nearly sure but i have a book of indian botany here he took a volume from the bookshelves and turned the leaves with trembling fingers yes compare it with this picture it is the exact duplicate this is the flower of the upas tree which usually grows only in the depths of the forests and the flower fades so quickly after being plucked that it is scarcely possible to keep its former color even so far as the outskirts of the forest "'Yet this is in full bloom. "'Where did you get these flowers?' he added with breathless eagerness. "'I glanced at Sylvie, who gravely and silently laid her finger on her lips, "'then beckoned to Bruno to follow her, and ran out into the garden, "'and I found myself in the position of a defendant "'whose two most important witnesses have been suddenly taken away. "'Let me give you the flowers,' I stammered out at last, quite at my wit's end, as to how to get out of the difficulty. You know much more about them than I do. I accept them most gratefully. But you have not yet told me, the Earl was beginning, when we were interrupted to my great relief by the arrival of Eric Linden. To Arthur, however, the newcomer was, I saw clearly, anything but welcome. His face clouded over. He drew a little back from the circle, and took no further part in the conversation which was wholly maintained for some minutes by Lady Muriel and her lively cousin, who were discussing some new music that had just arrived from London. "'Do just try this one,' he pleaded. "'The music looks easy to sing at sight, and the song's quite appropriate to the occasion. "'Then I suppose it's five o'clock tea ever to thee, faithful I'll be, five o'clock tea,' laughed Lady Muriel as she sat down to the piano, and lightly struck a few random chords. "'Not quite.' And yet it is a kind of ever to thee faithful I'll be. It's a pair of hapless lovers. He crosses the briny deep, and she is left lamenting. That is indeed appropriate, she replied mockingly, as he placed the song before her. And am I to do the lamenting? And who for, if you please? She played the air once or twice through, first in quick, and finally in slow time and then gave us the whole song with as much graceful ease as if she had been familiar with it all her life. He stepped so lightly to the land, all in his manly pride. He kissed her cheek, he pressed her hand, yet still she glanced aside. Too gay he seems, she darkly dreams, too gallant and too gay, to think of me, poor simple me, when he is far away. I bring my love this goodly pearl across the seas, he said. A gem to deck the dearest girl that ever sailor wed. She clasps it tight, her eyes are bright, her throbbing heart would say, He thought of me, he thought of me, when he was far away. The ship has sailed into the west, 
her ocean bird is flown a dull dead pain is in her breast and she is weak and lone yet there's a smile upon her face a smile that seems to say he'll think of me he'll think of me when he is far away though waters wide between us glide our lives are warm and near no distance parts two faithful hearts two hearts that love so dear and i will trust my sailor lad for ever and a day to think of me to think of me when he is far away the look of displeasure which had begun to come over arthur's face when the young captain spoke of love so lightly faded away as the song proceeded and he listened with evident delight but his face darkened again when eric demurely remarked don't you think my soldier lad would have fitted the tune just as well why so it would lady muriel gaily retorted soldiers sailors tinkers tailors what a lot of words would fit in i think my tinker lad sounds best don't you to spare my friend further pain i rose to go just as the earl was beginning to repeat his particularly embarrassing question about the flowers you have not yet yes i've had some tea thank you i hastily interrupted him and now we really must be going good evening lady muriel and we made our adieus and escaped while the earl was still absorbed in examining the mysterious bouquet lady muriel accompanied us to the door you couldn't have given my father a more acceptable present she said warmly he is so passionately fond of botany i'm afraid i know nothing of the theory of it but i keep his hortus siccus in order i must get some sheets of blotting paper and dry these new treasures for him before they fade that won't be no good at all said bruno who was waiting for us in the garden why won't it said i you know i had to give the flowers to stop the questions yes it can't be helped said sylvie but they will be sorry when they find them gone but how will they go well i don't know how but they will go the nosegay was only a flizz you know bruno made it up these last words were in a whisper as she evidently did not wish arthur to hear but of this there seemed to be little risk he hardly seemed to notice the children but paced on silent and abstracted and when at the entrance to the wood they bid us a hasty farewell and ran off he seemed to wake out of a day-dream the bouquet vanished as sylvie had predicted and when a day or two afterwards arthur and i once more visited the hall we found the earl and his daughter with the old housekeeper out in the garden examining the fastenings of the drawing-room window we are holding an inquest lady muriel said advancing to meet us and we admit you as accessories before the fact to tell us all you know about those flowers the accessories before the fact decline to answer any questions i gravely replied and they reserve their defence well then turn queen's evidence please the flowers have disappeared in the night she went on turning to arthur and we are quite sure no one in the house has meddled with them somebody must have entered by the window but the fastenings have not been tampered with said the earl it must have been while you were dining my lady said the housekeeper that was it said the earl the thief must have seen you bring the flowers turning to me and have noticed that you did not take them away and he must have known their great value they are simply priceless he exclaimed in sudden excitement and you never told us how you got them said lady muriel some day i stammered i may be free to tell you just now would you excuse me the earl looked disappointed but kindly said very well we will ask no questions but we consider you a very bad queen's evidence lady muriel added playfully as we entered the arbor we pronounce you to be an accomplice and we sentence you to solitary confinement and to be fed on bread and butter do you take sugar it is disquieting certainly she resumed when all creature comforts had been duly supplied to find that the house has been entered by a thief in this out-of-the-way place if only the flowers had been edibles one might have suspected a thief of quite another shape you mean that universal explanation for all mysterious disappearances the cat did it said arthur yes she replied what a convenient thing it would be if all thieves had the same shape it's so confusing to have some of them quadrupeds and others bipeds it has occurred to me said arthur as a curious problem in telology the science of final causes 
he added in answer to an inquiring look from Lady Muriel. And a final cause is? Well, suppose we say the last of a series of connected events, each of the series being the cause of the next, for whose sake the first event takes place. But the last event is practically an effect of the first, isn't it? And yet you call it a cause of it. Arthur pondered a moment. The words are rather confusing, I grant you, he said. Will this do? The last event is an effect of the first, but the necessity for that event is a cause of the necessity for the first. That seems clear enough, said Lady Muriel. Now let us have the problem. It's merely this. What object can we imagine in the arrangement by which each different size, roughly speaking, of living creatures has its special shape? For instance, the human race has one kind of shape, bipeds. Another set, ranging from the lion to the mouse, are quadrupeds. Go down a step or two further, and you come to insects with six legs, hexapods. A beautiful name, is it not? But beauty, in our sense of the word, seems to diminish as we go down. The creatures become more, I won't say ugly, of any of God's creatures, more uncouth. And when we take the microscope and go a few steps lower still, we come upon animoculae, terribly uncouth, and with a terrible number of legs. The other alternative, said the Earl, would be a diminuendo series of repetitions of the same type. Never mind the monotony of it. Let's see how it would work in other ways. Begin with the race of men and the creatures they require. Let us say horses, cattle, sheep, and dogs. We don't exactly require frogs and spiders, do we, Muriel? Lady Muriel shuddered perceptibly. It was evidently a painful subject. We can dispense with them, she said gravely. Well, then, we'll have a second race of men, half a yard high. Who would have one source of exquisite enjoyment not possessed by ordinary men, Arthur interrupted. What source, said the Earl? Why, the grandeur of scenery. Surely the grandeur of a mountain, to me, depends on its size relative to me. Double the height of the mountain, and of course it's twice as grand. Have my height, and you produce the same effect. Happy, happy, happy small, Lady Muriel murmured rapturously. None but the short, none but the short. None but the short enjoy the tall. But let me go on, said the earl. We'll have a third race of men, five inches high, and a fourth race an inch high. They couldn't eat common beef and mutton, I'm sure, Lady Muriel interrupted. True, my child, I was forgetting. Each set must have its own cattle and sheep, and its own vegetation, I added. What could a cow an inch high do with grass that waved far above its head? That is true. We must have a pasture within a pasture, so to speak. The common grass would serve our inch-high cows as a green forest of palms, while round the root of each tall stem would stretch a tiny carpet of microscopic grass. Yes, I think our scheme will work fairly well, and it would be very interesting coming into contact with the races below us. What sweet little things inch-high bulldogs would be! I doubt if even Muriel would run away from one of them. "'Don't you think we ought to have a crescendo series as well?' said Lady Muriel. "'Only fancy being a hundred yards high. One could use an elephant as a paperweight, and a crocodile as a pair of scissors. "'And would you have races of different sizes communicate with one another?' I inquired. "'Would they make war on one another, for instance, or enter into treaties? "'War we must exclude, I think. "'When you could crush a whole nation with one blow of your fist,' You couldn't conduct war on equal terms. But anything involving a collision of minds only would be possible in our ideal world. For, of course, we must allow mental powers to all, irrespective of size. Perhaps the fairest rule would be that the smaller the race, the greater should be its intellectual development. Do you mean to say, said Lady Muriel, that these mannequins of an inch high are to argue with me? Surely, surely, said the Earl. An argument doesn't depend for its logical force on the size of the creature that utters it. She tossed her head indignantly. I would not argue with any man less than six inches high, she cried. I'd make him work. What at, said Arthur, listening to all this nonsense with an amused smile. Embroidery, she readily replied. What lovely embroidery they would do. Yet even if they did it wrong, I said, you couldn't argue the question. 
I don't know why, but I agree that it couldn't be done. The reason is, said Lady Muriel, one couldn't sacrifice one's dignity so far. Of course one couldn't, echoed Arthur, any more than one could argue with a potato. It would be altogether, excuse the ancient pun, infradig. I doubt it, said I. Even a pun doesn't quite convince me. Well, if that is not the reason, said Lady Muriel, what reason would you give? I tried hard to understand the meaning of this question, but the persistent humming of the bees confused me, and there was a drowsiness in the air that made every thought stop and go to sleep before it had got well thought out. So all I could say was, that must depend on the weight of the potato. I felt the remark was not so sensible as I should have liked it to be, but Lady Muriel seemed to take it quite as a matter of course. In that case, she began, but suddenly started and turned away to listen. "'Don't you hear him?' she said. "'He's crying. We must go to him somehow.' And I said to myself, "'That's very strange.' I quite thought it was Lady Muriel talking to me. "'Why, it's Sylvie all the while.' And I made another great effort to say something that should have some meaning in it. "'Is it about the potato?' End of chapter 20 Light come, light go Recording by Patty Cunningham.